Hi, I'm Jay, and thanks for spending some of your available free time and attention on watching this video today. Today we're talking about the concept of creating capability and how we bring that to bear in working modes. This is a thing we talk about a lot in the Obscurity Works workshop. It's a thing I talk about in my professional work, and it's really how I sort of think about skill acquisition, creativity, making things, and, and doing stuff, and how to understand which mode we are in. We'll talk about what I mean by mode here in a bit. All right, so I wanna start off with a little bit of a story that my sister told me, which was that there was an evening she was making dinner with her kids and she found herself really frustrated with how long it was taking for dinner to get on the table. And in that moment, she stopped herself and re reframed her own thinking about the situation because she realized that she actually was not making dinner. She was not actively engaged primarily in making dinner. Dinner was a secondary effect from her actual primary task in having brought those kids into the kitchen to work together on making this meal. Her primary task was actually making capable people. She was focused on ensuring that those kids learned the skills that night to, for instance, dice an onion or how to uh, how to puree something with a blender safely, how to do these, these skills in a kitchen that anybody who's going to feed themselves or their family tomorrow or into the future as they become adults, but those are the capabilities she really wanted her children to have. And that was her primary purpose. The fact that dinner was gonna end up on the table as a sort of side effect of that was a nice bonus. But in fact, if the primary purpose of these kids learning how to how to work in the kitchen on this this meal was was the goal, it was entirely possible that they might have to order takeout because the kids failed and learned in the process. But this goal of the the actual meal being prepared might actually be missed, and that would be fine because the primary goal was making capable people. So what do we mean by capabilities? Well, we do mean that this thing like we're talking about a kitchen. We mean the ability to the capability to, for instance, take a tool like a knife and a skill, which is how to use your, your fingers and your manual dexterity to, for instance, hold an onion in place and to slice off the end and cut it and peel it and then dice the up onion up into small pieces. And that whole combination is the capability of being able to dice an onion. And then when, when you take those kinds of capabilities and you stack them up, you take a capability like the ability, like the capability to dice an onion, and you add to that the capability to also chop up carrots and celery, and the capability to uh, put them all in a pot, and to know to watch the to set the the temperature to a boil and then turn it down to a simmer. And you suddenly now are talking about a capability of making soup. And the capability of making soup depends on or is built on top of, builds up of, the ability to use a stove, a pot, knives, and the, the, the capability to go grocery shopping to buy the vegetables that went into the soup. All of those things are built up. So we, we take capabilities that we have and we build up additional capabilities and integrating new tools. So if you previously knew how to dice the onion but you'd never yet used the stove, your capability of making soup is taking your existing capabilities and integrating new tools of the stove and the pot to actually turn it into soup. In our brains, this actually is a very real thing uh, where we take in our neocortex, we take the bundling of skills that our brain knows how to do. Our brain knows how to take, for instance, this, this motion of, of grasping your hand and it is able to give it sort of a high level bundle that it can invoke whenever it wants to and without having to think about the individual motions inside of it. So if I tell my brain to close my hand, that's the level at which I think about it, which is to make a fist. And I don't have to think about how each individual joint moves. I don't have to think about each of the individual muscles in here and how they do that. At one point when I was a small, small, small child, my brain figured out how to get individual control over my fingers. And when I became a piano player, it learned how to get individual control over my ring finger, which is a skill that a lot of people don't have until they're forced 
or, or choose to go down a musical path. And as those skills bundle together, we get the ability to work at a higher level and to think at a higher level without having to consciously think about the individual little pieces. And when we think about the individual little pieces instead, like for instance, if you were to try to go up and down a flight of stairs and consciously think about what you have to do with your feet and your center of balance and your entire body's uh, coordinated activity, if you had to think about that consciously, you would probably either lock up or you would stumble and fall. And in athletics, we refer to that as choking. Uh, we've actually given a name to this idea of overthinking a thing, which is otherwise had, had previously been automatic. And this is actually detailed in a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of good information in the book uh, on intelligence by Jeff Hawkins. There's probably uh, subsequent books that have come out, but this is, this gave me a really uh, nice understanding of like how to apply this to daily life, I guess. All right. So once we have a bunch of capabilities, we then tend to use them to create stuff. We take our capabilities and we go and we make a thing, we do a thing, we pursue an activity, but we, but for the purposes that I tend to work, which is in, in the workshop and in my software career and as a writer and all these things, I tend to think a lot about capabilities that are focused on creativity in particular. And creativity for the purposes of this conversation, there's a thousand definitions we can use about creativity. But for the purposes of this conversation, I'm talking about how we combine multiple of our capabilities and our inputs, which are the, the ways in which we've seen other people use those same capabilities and our available resources together to create a thing. And this is sort of a multiplication, multiplication kind of a uh, relationship between them. And so our capabilities, which if we're talking about something like painting would mean I have enough manual dexterity in my hand to control uh, a paintbrush. And those are, and, and I can do that with watercolor, I can do that with acrylic, and I can do that with oil. So I have the, all of those capabilities. And then my inputs would be, I have seen and studied enough historical art to be aware of things like cubism and impressionism and the various styles of art that are available. And I've also been to places in the world where I have seen things. I've seen photos of, of places I have never been, but I have seen canyons and mountains and clouds. So there are things that I can, that have been my inputs that I can combine with my capabilities. And then my resources are things like the actual paint that I have available to me today. So if all I have is a little eight color watercolor thing from the, the craft store, I'm probably not going to be able to do anything that requires oil technique, for example. But I combine those things together and I can create a painting. And one of the things that's important about that is the is the inputs piece. We really want to see, if you want to make sure that you have the, the best ability to create, you want to make sure that you've got inputs, that you've explored the world around you, that you've explored the, the uh, possibilities in order to have enough inputs. So for instance, if I am looking to, to take this creativity formula to something like making leather uh, journal covers, which is a thing that I'm actually in the middle of designing new ones, I can look at a place like Pinterest and I can see the various ways in which other people in, have solved various problems around it. You can see, if you look at this, and you may want to pause to look in, in more detail, but there are quite a few different ways in which pens are stored for instance there's loops there's str uh, strips that are across there's interleaving latches there's versions of this that don't even cover the notebook entirely they just provide a little a little slice uh, of of a cover and all of them can then feed as inputs my understanding of how i want to design a journal cover and how i want it to work but if i wasn't aware of all these I might have a very limited number of options that I would consider, but because my inputs have been wide and varied and I'm working on my capabilities, which is like, can I cut leather accurately? Can I stitch leather together in a way that, that works and it results in clean seams? And then what resources do I have? What materials do I have available to me? The inputs then become a valuable part of that equation and raising the level of what I can do. And I not only want to do just looking at 
what people have done in, in leather journals, but I may want to look at, for instance, leather bags. Are there ways that the clasps on these are different than the, the clasps people are using on leather journal covers? Are there ways that I can fasten the cover closed that I could borrow from leather bags or cloth bags or various other things? The point is largely to ensure that you are consuming a wide array of inputs as alongside your, your creation of capabilities and your addition of capabilities. A lot of people worry that if you look at, at, at something, you're going to steal. The problem with that is that if you actually look at nothing, you're almost certainly going to be imitating the thing that already exists, but you won't know that you're imitating it. All right. And then the, the, the danger of, if you look at one thing, then there's a pretty high chance you're going to imitate it by just virtue of not having a lot of uh, other options in your head of what to work with. If you've only ever seen paintings of landscapes, that's what you're going to paint. If you've only ever seen uh, a certain style, that's what you're going to imitate. If you've only read one book and you don't read and you decide you're going to write a novel, you are almost certainly going to imitate more of that novel than you intend to. But if you combine and look at thousands of things, you're going to blend them together and create something new. You're going to take little pieces from each of those things and blend them into something that people will recognize as being new. And this is when you talk to experts in almost any field and somebody says, I have created a brand new thing that has never existed and they put it forward. People who have surveyed a, a wide variety of inputs will almost always see similarities. And they will say, oh, that's like this other thing that I've seen before. That's like this other version of it that exists over here. And it's entirely possible the person who created it is unaware of those things. It doesn't change the fact that you're actually imitating them anyway. And so you really should be encouraged, and I'm encouraging you, to not shy away, to, to not worry about that, that kind of imitation and in so doing, like, pull back. Instead, you should lean in on it and consume as many things as you can in order to get enough inputs that you are blending things together and creating something new instead of accidental imitation. So I encourage you to go out and consume, explore the, the, the possibilities, find out what spice options are available to you, blend them together and make something genuinely interesting. Now, when you are in the actual creation, when you are in the, that, that moment of making a thing, you're going to be in one of several modes. One of those modes is the mode of production. You are making the actual thing for sale or as a gift or for yourself, but you are making the final product. That's the purpose of the mode you are in. There's also a mode which is research and development, which is I'm trying to design a thing that I've never made before or I am trying to learn capabilities. And in that research and development mode, you are in a different way of thinking than you are in production mode. And I think of one other mode, which is the mode of practice. All right, so again, production is about producing the product. Research and development is about building your capability and your knowledge. You're gonna make four of this thing and not be quite sure that any of them is going to work correctly. Some of them are not going to work. You are going to try a new way of, of, if we're talking leather journals, a new way of stitching a thing, a new way of adhering fabric to leather, and a new way of rolling the seam so you can cover the edge of that fabric. These are, these are you building new capabilities and expanding your knowledge of, oh, that glue really didn't work for attaching the fabric. It soaks through, and therefore it was a really bad choice for that. We, will, we now have this knowledge, and we can apply it when it's time to make the production ones we can do so efficiently and effectively. And so in this mode, there's a lot more waste. There's a lot more exploration. There's a lot more tolerance for failure. All of those things are part of a research and development mode. And there also is the practice mode, which is about taking your capability and making it smooth and automatic, transforming it from, I'm kind of trying to figure out how to do a thing and turn it into, I can produce five of these in a day 
and I know exactly how to do that. I know how to do it smoothly. My materials are in the right order. My tools are set up for that. It is nearly automatic. I can do things very, very quickly. And to me, it is super important when you're in a workshop in particular, but in, in a lot of endeavors, creative endeavors in life, to recognize which of these modes you are currently in. If you do not yet know how to do a thing, trying to be in the production mode is almost certainly going to be frustrating. You are going to be attempting to make a thing and you are going to be failing at making that thing and that's gonna stress you out. But if you understood that you were in research and development mode, you can accept the thing that you create as being good enough for research and development mode or even good enough for practice mode, but it wasn't good enough for production mode. And as an example, I'm gonna show you this which is the very first wall that I made when resuming an attempt to learn how to do leather work here as an adult. And this is the very first, I was working out the skill of how to be a leather worker. And you'll see here in this corner, I made a mistake in the stitching and I ended up crossing over and going back. I also made several mistakes in the cutting of this leather so that these pieces do not all line up correctly. And so if I was to try to put this wallet on Etsy and sell it, there are far too many flaws in it for that for it to be of production quality. So in research and development mode, I made a thing. But this thing is not what I was making. I was making the skill of being able to make wallets. I was improving my own capability to do a thing. I happen to end up with a wallet that's good enough that I can use for my own purposes, and so I carry it. It's also a nice reminder of this whole idea. But this wallet was absolutely not at a quality that I can sell. I need to, in fact, now that I have learned enough about leather working to make one of these, I started working on practicing, which is that I cut several more of them out. And I'm much better now at lining up and making sure those the curves on the corners line up correctly, that the, the sizes are all the same. I'm much better about getting my stitches aligned correctly. I'm much better about making sure that I stitch in the right order and I don't make that corner mistake again. And as I'm practicing, I'm producing things that are a little closer to production quality. They're good enough that I might give some to friends or I might sell them, but with a disclaimer that they are of lower quality, that they were practice wallets, that sort of thing, so that people understand they're not buying something that I'm claiming is of full production quality. And I've even gone so far in, in a couple of these wallets to make one, decide that I didn't like how I did the stitching, rip the stitching out and make the same one using the same pieces of leather to practice my stitching and make it better. And, and so it's when you're, when you can understand which of these modes you're in, you can sort of accept the, the constraints of that mode. You can accept the reality of those mode, that mode. You can say, I'm in research and development mode. I'm going to make several of these things that are not going to turn out correctly because in research and development mode, I am not making wallets. I'm making a wallet maker. When I am practicing music with uh, the instruments that are behind me and the music room that's on the other side of that curtain, and I am trying to learn a new thing, I am trying to make a musician. When I then work on practice, I am turning that capability into a smooth and automatic thing so that I can be a musician good enough to listen to. Uh, all of those things are about making the maker and less about making the thing. And when you then start to make a couple of things that look like you've maybe acquired some capability, then you start working on practice and refining it and being able to re recreate it the same way every time. This is, and you're talking about athletics. If you can hit a golf ball once, that's great. But if you can hit the golf ball to the same place repeatedly, that's what practice gives you. It turns it into a repeatable capability. And then you can take that capability and go play the game. Or you can go open an Etsy shop and start selling things. And I'm in the middle with Obscurity Works with Aaron. We're in the middle of sort of a long phase of research and development mode. We are focused on making sure that we are acquiring new skills and capabilities to figure out what products we want to make, which ones go quickly, which ones take too long, which ones are too expensive to make in a production mode. And that's the mode that we're in because we're aiming for that workshop to be 
a self-sustaining thing several years from now. We are not worried about it being self-sustaining now. So all that being said, keep this in mind in your next project. Think about which mode you're actually in and recognize the differences that those modes have and work on building your new capabilities. Thanks for your time and attention, and I'll see you next time.